Hello everyone. Today in series of Doplex's KOL interviews, we have with us Dr. William F. Young, who is the Professor of Medicine in the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and the Chair of the Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes, Metabolism and Nutrition. In 2010, he received a named professorship, the highest academic distinction at Mayo Clinic. Thank you, Dr. Young, for this interview. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling very well, thank you. I'm <laughs> glad to be here. That is wonderful. Let me start by asking you a few questions that our viewers would love to hear from you. Could you please elaborate on the epidemiology and clinical manifestations of Cushing syndrome? Okay, well, that, that's a mouthful. <laughs> um, in terms of epidemiology, the most common cause of Cushing syndrome is what we call exogenous Cushing syndrome. In other words, patients are giving cort corticosteroids to treat an illness, and then they develop the signs and symptoms of Cushing syndrome because if they're on superphysiologic doses, they get those signs and symptoms. The least common form of Cushing syndrome we call endogenous Cushing syndrome, and that's where the patient's own adrenal glands are making too much corticosteroids. And we can talk a little bit more about that. But the signs and symptoms, whether endogenous or exogenous, are the same. They typically include weight gain. The weight gain typically is more of a central weight gain, abdominal, behind the neck, and the supraclavicular areas. And as they gain that weight, they lose weight in their arms and legs because they lose muscle mass. Excess corticosteroids are catabolic to muscle, so it breaks muscle down. So the arms and legs get thin, but these patients gain weight here, in the face, and above the shoulders. So it's a very unique clinical phenotype. As that's occurring, they develop high blood pressure, diabetes, thin bones, osteoporosis. Um, as they're gaining the weight, the skin gets thin, so they get these purple-red stretch marks called striae. The striae typically are on the flanks, under the arms, on the side of the breast, the inner thigh. Um, and the, the face gets round and red. Women who have Cushing's tend to get excess facial hair on the sideburn area, on the chin. Um, so it's a unique phenotype. There are many other components of, of Cushing syndrome, but they're also common with other disorders. So there can be psycho psychologic components, depression, for example, uh, menstrual irregularity uh, is, is common. But the most specific things are that central weight gain, red round face, hirsutism, and thinning of the arms and legs. And in your opinion, what are the recent advances in the diagnosis and the treatments for Cushing syndrome? Probably the biggest advance in the last 20 years has been a test that can tell you where ACTH is coming from. So now we're talking about endogenous Cushing syndrome, where something's going on inside the body causing the patient to make excess cortisol. In the past, to figure out if a patient had a pituitary tumor making excess ACTH telling the adrenals to make excess cortisol versus, for example, a tumor in the lung making ACTH, they would go through a series of suppression tests and stimulation tests. Um, now, once you diagnose ACTH dependent Cushing's, we would do a pituitary MRI scan, and if we don't see a tumor, most of those patients would have something called inferior petrosis sinus sampling. It's where we put catheters in the veins and the groin, run them all the way up to the pituitary gland, and we give a hormone called CRH. It tells the pituitary tumor to make excess ACTH. So you measure the ACTH coming out of the pituitary at the same time you're measuring it in the arm. And we're looking for a gradient between the head and the arm. If a patient has a tumor in the lung making ACTH, there is no ACTH gradient between the head and the arm. And that's called ectopic ACTH syndrome. Whereas if the patient has a pituitary tumor, then we'll see a lot of ACTH coming out of the head. So that's called inferior petrosis sinus sampling, and it's really streamlined our diagnostic approach to the most common form of endogenous Cushing's, and that's ACTH dependent Cushing's. And what would you project as some of the potential new treatments for managing Cushing's syndrome? Yeah, so there have been more drugs 
uh, on the market to treat Cushing's. The problem is, no matter what drug we would talk about, I don't have a drug that can make a patient normal. I, the drugs help decrease cortisol production or block cortisol effect, but I don't have a way of adjusting those doses to make that person normal. So in the end, the best and definitive treatment for Cushing's syndrome is going to be an operation, surgery, either taking out the pituitary tumor, taking out the ectopic tumor, making ACTH, for example, bronchial carcinoid in the lung, or if the patient has adrenal-dependent Cushing's, taking out the adrenal tumor. So surgery has been the mainstay of curing Cushing syndrome for the past almost 100 years. Um, and that remains the best treatment today. We do have more medications we can use, but again, they're, they're really not curative. And would you, would you mind throwing some light on the pathophysiology of diabetes mellitus in Cushing syndrome? So patients can develop diabetes if they make too much of what's called a counter-regulatory hormone. There are four counter-regulatory hormones to insulin. One of them is cortisol. Others, for example, catecholamines or growth hormone. So if you make enough cortisol, it's, it's preventing insulin from being effective, and then the patient develops diabetes. And it's also diabetes is more common in Cushing syndrome because these people gain weight, primarily fat mass. Uh, so there's a couple reasons that patients with Cushing syndrome uh, develop diabetes. The good news is if you cure Cushing syndrome, the diabetes is reversible. That is really good to know. And um, in your opinion, could you talk a little bit more about the laparoscopic adrenalectomy for patients who have Cushing syndrome? So, you know, we talked about the major diagnostic advance the last two decades is inferior petrosis sinus sampling. The major treatment advance is, is laparoscopic adrenalectomy. Before 1992, when we operate on the adrenal glands, it would be an open operation, either from the front or the back. The patient would be in the hospital four to six nights, wouldn't get back to work for four to six weeks. But with the laparoscopic approach, uh, the patient's in the hospital one night, and they're back doing usual activities in seven to 10 days. So it has been a major advance. Um, if the patient has one adrenal disease, for example, benign adenoma in the adrenal, uh, laparoscopic unilateral adrenalectomy is an excellent treatment option. We also use the laparoscopic approach to the adrenal glands in patients with that more common form of endogenous Cushing syndrome, ACTH dependent Cushing syndrome. For example, the patient with a pituitary tumor, but we did not cure them with a pituitary operation. And again, I don't have a good lifelong medical management. So in those patients, many times, we'll take the adrenal glands out because they're the, they're the source of cortisol. They're not the source of the primary problem, but if you can't effectively take out that tumor, um, you're really left with uh, taking out the adrenal glands. So you can do bilateral laparoscopic adrenalectomy in those patients. Thank you so much, doctor. I'm sure our viewers are going to greatly benefit from hearing your invaluable thoughts on all these facets. And thank you once again. You're welcome. Glad <laughs> to be here today.